you so much for coming up to Columbia today to talk to us. Thank you so much for having me. You are CBS News international correspondent mm -hmm. and a 2013 winner of the Alfred I. DuPont Award. You are one of the most intrepid and recognized international correspondents of the day. And um, we're thrilled to have you back at Columbia. Before we get started, um, you've covered every international, major international story um, over the last decade, really. Yeah, it's been all. It's been almost exactly ten years now. Um, I started going to Iraq as a very young producer, and I was living in Beirut and traveling around the Middle East. And then I lived in Russia for two years, and then I lived in China for two years. And for the past three and a half years, I've been based out of London for CBS News, but obviously not spending very much time in London at all. Mm. And when we first, when we met a couple of years ago, you were, you had begun traveling into Syria and have done some phenomenal reporting Thank out of you. Syria over the past, I guess, since 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk to you about that. But before I do, let's talk about your most recent story from 60 Minutes about the migrant crisis going on in Europe. Tell us about how, how you started on this story, how many months went into it. Mm. Um, this story was really a labor of love, to be honest. I've been wanting to do it for over a year. Um, and then earlier this year, I convinced uh, Jeff Fager, who's the executive producer of 60 Minutes, that this would be a great story. And uh, essentially, we set about this very convoluted process because we knew we wanted to cover the story from both sides. We wanted to see it from the European perspective, from the rescuers' perspective, this sort of mass of humanity coming across the Mediterranean. But we also wanted to understand it from the perspective of the people who were getting on these boats and risking their lives for a shot at a better future. So uh, that entailed many logistics and lots of moving parts because we knew we wanted to get uh, cell phone cameras on boats. We knew we wanted to work out how the smuggling ring operated and we would need hidden cameras and we would need people on the ground in Turkey who were able to uh, sort of get involved and get access to that very tightly knit um, circuit of Syrian refugees and also of these smugglers who were running this massive operation um, out of Mersin, this Turkish seaport. So there were multiple moving parts and we were shooting in lots of different countries and the Syrian family who we followed for quite some time ended up going to Greece and we had been doing most of our shooting in Italy. Um, and the other moving part that was very difficult to lock down was getting access to the Italian Coast Guard, going out on a search and rescue mission. They have not really let anybody, any other journalist, with the exception of uh, Italian state television, Rai, onto one of their boats. And I think that's partly because it's become a very political issue in Europe and they don't really want to be at, at the center of the political debate about this subject. But after multiple trips to Italy and Sicily uh, and essentially culminated, I think, we were able to get a cameraman on the boat, but no one else. And I flew to Sicily and camped out at the port. And basically, as soon as uh, the boat came back, I said, well, you'll just take me when you go back out again. And they were sort of like, that's not really how it works. But uh, I think by then I had made it clear to them that our intentions were really good with this story, that we weren't looking, this wasn't like a political hatchet job. We wanted to uh, shed a light on the incredible, brave, and difficult work that the Italian Coast Guard is doing. So we were very proud of it. It was a major team effort, four months, four countries, lots of people working together. But I really hope that it showed Americans a different side of this crisis. Absolutely. And then in terms of um, your waiting in Sicily, the Mediterranean, it's a big sea. Mm. And even though there are lots, maybe many boats afloat, you know, leaving from Libya, how would you even know how soon you would be able to connect with one of these boats? I mean, the timing, how did that work? You, uh, this is why, this part of the reason it took so long um, for us to be able to actually get on one of these boats, uh, because it's, it is, uh, you know, people don't, it's not the Pacific or the Atlantic, but it is, it's a large body of water, and 
it's over a you know a huge area it's not such a simple thing as oh, i'll just go to sicily and probably a boat will come even if you're going to sicily there are multiple ports in sicily that the boats are coming in and out of there's also lampedusa which is an island that is the southernmost uh, italian territory which is much closer to libya They've previously been bringing a lot of migrants there as well. And in some cases, they've even been taking them to the Italian coast uh, of the mainland. So there was no clear sense of, oh, yes, this will work out well if we go to X place or Y place. But I think after we pushed and pushed and pushed with the Italian Coast Guard, once I had a cameraman on that boat, I knew. And even then, we only knew 12 hours beforehand. He said, we're coming back to Sicily, not Lampedusa. And even then, sitting in Sicily, it was only four hours beforehand that I knew we're coming to the port of Catania. So uh, there were a lot of sort of, you know, crazed moments where you're like sitting in your rental car being like, I just need to know where I have to go. <laughs> um, and it did work out in the end, but it, it, it required a lot of effort from a lot of people. What about the story surprised you the most? You probably went in with a ton of research, but then <clears> when you actually saw the boat, saw the people, what's, what was surprising? I mean, what really surprised me, I had, I think, assumed that people maybe didn't really understand the risks, that they didn't understand how dangerous it was, that they weren't well informed. And talking to all these people on the boats, whether they were from Eritrea, whether they were from Syria, they all seemed actually pretty cognizant of the fact that this was a risk, that they could well have died. And when you're sitting there talking to someone, a father who was with his wife and children, and that's another thing, I had not anticipated just how many women and children there would be. Many of these women were pregnant, and the children that we were seeing were not teenagers. They were, they were toddlers. They were babies, even. So to really get a sense of the desperation that one must feel to make the unbelievably difficult decision to put your family in potentially in harm's way on a rubber raft and just head out to the open sea that really blew me away i hadn't been prepared for that and i also think we assume these are the most desperate of the desperate actually these are the people who can afford to get on the boats these are the people who have enough money to leave Eritrea and go via Sudan to Libya and to pay the smugglers and to get on uh, and to get on a boat or whether they're in Syria and trying to get to Greece or whatever it may be. These are actually not the most desperate of the desperate. So it gives you a sense of perspective uh, that is kind of jaw dropping. Unbelievable. So Clarissa, you studied at Yale. Mm -hmm. Did what was your degree? I studied comparative literature. Um, I've always been very passionate about languages and, and literature, and I was studying French and Italian and then starting to study Russian. Um, and I love Russian literature, so Complet was sort of a nice way to combine all of the different things that interested me. I sadly was not at a stage where I could read Russian literature in Russian. Um, but still, it was, uh, it was a great major and a great experience. And people ask me a lot, you know, do you wish that you'd gone to journalism school or why didn't you study journalism? Yale didn't actually offer journalism, but I think that, you know, there are so many things that would have been useful that you would learn at journalism school, undoubtedly, that I had to like learn along the way as I, as I started my career. But I would never regret my decision to study comparative literature and all the books that I've read as a result and and what you learn about writing and reading and languages it's it has all served me well in the end and how useful has that been knowing having some language skill in particular for me it's so useful um, and I don't know if that's just the way I work or uh, I really find that speaking a language, even if you don't speak it perfectly, even if you just speak it conversationally, barriers come down, uh, doors are opened, and people are much more willing to tell you their story and to uh, invite you into their lives, essentially. Also on a practical level, I could never have done the work I did in Syria without speaking some Arabic because I wasn't traveling with a translator. The first time I was traveling on my own, 
The second time I was traveling with one other person uh, who was like a producer who was also shooting. So we were all doing multiple jobs. And, and it will often happen. I mean, again, I was on the boat in Italy just now. The Coast Guard did not speak um, English. I, you know, I don't often get to use my Italian, but suddenly it became actually very helpful to speak Italian. So I find that languages are, are a wonderful way of uh, getting a slightly different perspective on a story or getting a slightly more intimate approach with your subjects. Uh, at the same time, I don't think it's like a crucial thing. Like if you don't speak languages, you shouldn't do international news. Not at all. It just happens to be something that I felt passionately about. And it's, it's sort of dovetailed really nicely with my work. So you mentioned when you went into Syria for the first time. This is in 2011. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was the beginning of the reporting that you then went on to win the DuPont Award for That's in correct. 2013. How did you decide to go and tell us how that all mm -hmm. came about? Well, so I had lived in Beirut uh, when I was uh, a little bit younger in t 2005 to 2007. And I used to visit Syria all the time because it was very easy. You just get a, a visa on the border, go up to Damascus for a few days. I would do Arabic classes there sometimes. And, and it was such a beautiful, interesting country uh, and very different from Lebanon, gave you a really different perspective. You sort of felt more in the Middle East there, I think, perhaps. So when the Arab Spring began unfolding and I saw it travel to Syria, I knew right away that this was a country I already had a strong sense of connection with. It's a country that I had already spent a lot of time in. Uh, and I wanted to work out a way to get to the story because, of course, what we kept seeing on TV and reading in newspaper articles, et cetera, was that uh, we can't confirm this story or verify this account because it's so hard for journalists to work in the country. And obviously the Assad regime at that time was not giving out any journalism visas. So, but I knew from experience that it actually wasn't too hard to get a tourism visa to go into Syria. Um, and I'm a dual national. I have a British passport as well. So uh, it would be much harder with an American passport. But with a British passport, I basically went online to all these travelers chat forums to see where people with European passports who were still going to Syria, who obviously were not very many at the time, but there were still some of them there, where they were picking up their visa from. I thought that if I tried to get it in London, someone might Google me. There might be a little bit of due diligence before giving me the visa. So I read that the, the country to do it in was a, a country in the Gulf. So I pitched to my uh, bosses at CBS. I said, let me go and try to go to this country and see if I can get a Syrian visa and let's just try it. And they said, that sounds wildly ambitious, but yes, let's try it. I was able to get the visa. The producer who I would have been working with was not. Um, because I was sort of playing the role of like hippie backpacker wearing like jeans and I had a backpack and seemed sort of spaced out and the ambassador was like, are you aware of, you know, <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, but I'm not really worried. I'm meeting a friend from New Zealand and we're only going to be in Damascus and Aleppo and uh, this is <laughs> a long time ago, obviously. So when I got the visa and he didn't, there was a sort of agonizing, well, do we just not do the trip? And I was like, um, yeah, no, <laughs> we're going to do the trip. It just means it's not going to look as good because I'm going to have to shoot it. So I took a very small, just like a point and shoot camera and a bunch of memory cards. And I spent two days posing as a tourist. And then I slipped off uh, and lived with a group of activists basically for a week. Unbelievable. Let's, can we take a look at some of that coverage? Finally, our last award tonight also goes for courageous reporting from Syria, for a gripping series of reports that gave us a glimpse into, as we know, a largely closed country. CBS News reporter Clarissa Ward entered Syria posing as a, a, turn, uh, posing as a tourist, carrying only her camera. With deliberate and straightforward reporting, she provided riveting details about the fighters, about the activists, and about regular citizens on the brink of civil war. The jury cited this as an important journalism done at great risk to the people doing it. And in this excerpt from the CBS Evening News with Scott Pelley, inside Syria, members of the Free Syrian Army tell Clarissa what they're fighting for, and we witness a harrowing gun battle. 
It was not a long drive, but our guides were taking no chances. Checkpoints. Past a government checkpoint, the car twisted along dark back roads outside the capital city, Damascus. After a certain point, we were blindfolded to protect the location of the safe house where we would find members of the Free Syrian Army. They are former Syrian soldiers. They say they refused orders to fire on their own countrymen and so decided to take up arms against the Assad regime. The commander spoke off camera for his own security. He told us, we are fighting those who have made our children orphans and our wives widows. He claimed that his men have carried out attacks on military targets around the capital, the heart of Assad's power base. No one knows just how large the Free Syrian Army is, but the number of defectors appears to be growing. In this video posted by the opposition, former Syrian soldiers pledged to defend the Syrian people against the Assad regime. Are you not scared that by turning this into an armed conflict, civilians may be hurt? We did not choose to go to war, the commander said. It was imposed upon us to protect our people and our honor. This is a battle being fought by farmers and workers very close to home. Just outside of the city, fighters moved in on a checkpoint set up by the Syrian army to choke off rebel traffic. The attack began. First one, then many opened fire. The enemy remained hidden from view. You are surrounded, the rebel leader called out to the Syrian soldiers. Defect and join us. But there was no surrender, and the battle raged on. Many of the fighters were young and inexperienced, like Fuad Hashan, a 23-year-old mechanic. Charge, charge, the men continued to shout. God is great. They lobbed grenades at the enemy, but the bullets kept coming. Moments later, Hashan was hit. Under fire, the commander struggled to lift his limp body. Other men joined to help before beating a hasty retreat. They tried to reclaim this checkpoint. They haven't been able to do it yet, and now there is a casualty. Someone has been hurt very badly. They're trying to take him to a hospital. By the time they got him there, Hashan was dead. At the hospital, body after body was hurried up the stairs, the men weeping for their fallen brothers. The honor of the Arabs is dead, this man said, and cursed President Assad. Crowds chanting the dead were carried home, where the women waited, wailing. We will take revenge on you, Assad. We will kill you, this woman cried. They wept over the bodies and pierced the night air with their grief. Please welcome CBS News correspondent Clarissa Ward. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Columbia University. We have to watch this bit. <laughs> no, we don't. Not at all. When you look at those pieces, what it, what comes to mind? I mean, the war has changed so much since then, right? Or but it's honestly to watch those pieces breaks my heart a little bit because so many people in those stories are dead. Um, the fundamental nature of the conflict has shifted um, irreparably, and. I think in the beginning, even though there was death and devastation, there was some hope uh, that Syrian people had, that it would not be in vain. And now it's sort of abundantly clear that um, there is only more bloodshed and, and sadness on the horizon and there is no clear, op like, easy option or easy way out or any real source of optimism even. Incredible. So you were up close to this fighting several years ago. Um, we all know how dangerous it is mm. today, sadly. People have lost their lives. Um, talk to me a little bit about what that was like 
and uh, you were, you're covered up in the video. Mm. Um, I think there are there might be misconceptions about what it's like as, to travel as a female correspondent in these sort of cultures and also, of course, in a conflict zone. Tell us right. a little bit about that. I mean, for me, the decision to wear hijab when I'm working in a place like Syria, uh, it's really a product of several things. First of all, um, looking the way I do, if I'm not covered up, I don't think that people are going to react negatively towards that. Syrian people are very embracing, generally, of uh, different cultures and different ways of life. But I definitely become the center of attention wherever I go, uh, being tall, being blonde, being a woman, uh, carrying a big camera with us. So I don't really like to be the center of attention when what I'm trying to do is watch what other people are doing and, and understand the scene that's you know going on around me. I tend to find it's a little bit counterproductive if everybody's looking at me, then I'm not able to really look at them. So that's a big part of why I uh, cover myself. I would say in this case, the primary reason I was doing it was for security reasons. There were no journalists or very, no, actually at that time, no journalists really in that part of the country. We had entered illegally across the Turkish border. So it was a very dangerous time and um, we didn't want to take any unnecessary risks. And the reality is that if you cover up uh, in the way that I did, people don't even look twice at you. It's amazing how, how the extent to which you're able to sort of fly under the radar if you take some really basic precautions. Um, and then thirdly, I would also say that for me personally, I have always found that if you respect other people's cultures and behave and dress in ways that are appropriate and normal in the places that you're spending time, people appreciate that. It goes a long way. Um, I think sometimes we have a perception here that it's somehow degrading to wear a headscarf, which I can't say I really understand fully because I, I personally don't believe it to be degrading at all. I don't think it in any way diminishes my status as a woman. Uh, I view it as a very simple thing. If I was invited to have tea at Buckingham Palace, I would not wear ripped jeans. And if I'm invited by uh, fighters in Syria to live in and among them, I'm not going to be wearing tank tops and blow drying my hair every day. So. <laughs> right, as this is appropriate for the culture. Yeah, yeah, and I just think actually being a woman has huge advantages even when you're traveling in more conservative societies because people understand that you do not have to adhere to the same social norms that their women do. But at the same time, you're also given a measure of uh, indulgence or respect that maybe my male colleagues don't get. And beyond that, there's, of course, the very obvious reality that my male colleagues are only exposed to about 50% uh, of these cultures because they don't have access to women and they can't go and sit in the kitchen and have conversations with them about their perspectives and how they see this conflict. And the reality is that women are a, a, a well of information, even though they may not be on the face of the story, they know what's happening. They know which groups are doing this and that and which fighter has been doing this. And so they're an excellent source of intelligence when you're trying to get your head around a story and trying to understand. And it's a complex picture like Syria is. There is nothing more valuable than sitting in the kitchen and, and having a conversation with the women of the family about how they see things. And you might even get to learn how to make kibbe while you're there. So. It's a win-win. It's a win-win, exactly. When were you last there in Syria? I was last in Syria in October of last year. Um, I traveled in to interview uh, Western jihadists who are fighting for hardcore Islamist groups. One of them is a Dutch former soldier, and one of them is an American uh, who is fighting with Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the sort of al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria. And the Dutchman who I interviewed, uh, who spoke so passionately in that interview, is now with ISIS. So it's probably the most dangerous country in the world for, for journalists, yeah. or certainly among the top group. Did you know Jim Foley? Yes, I did. He was a friend of mine um, and a wonderful human being and uh, unbelievably committed journalist. Um, 
and just a lovely, lovely, lovely man, gentle, lovely man. And that was, you know, look, of all the things, I, Syria has been heartbreaking on so many levels. The way the Syrian people have suffered is unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime. Uh, but losing Jim and losing Pete Kasig, who was also a friend of mine, um, that really took the conflict to a much more personal place. Um, I had obviously been a huge admirer and, and knew Anthony Shadid and, um, and Marie Colvin, but, but Jim and Pete were sort of my generation and, and, and my friends and people I had really spent time with. So um, that was uh, extremely difficult, absolutely. But I know or I believe that they would want people to continue to tell the story and it's just our responsibility to work diligently to find ways to do it where you're not being reckless and putting your life and other people's lives in danger. And that's become much more challenging as this conflict has gone on. And every trip I do requires months of preparation. But I always say, never say never. And so when people say, will you go back to Syria, I say, if the right story and the right opportunity presents itself, I absolutely will. But the bar is pretty high in terms of it really has to be doable in a sensible way. For you working with CBS, you have those resources. Mm. Other people freelancing or newly graduated journalism students might yeah. not. What would your advice be to someone, a young recent graduate of this school who is interested in covering Syria in particular? My advice would be you, I think there's like a, an instinct and it's a noble one and I understand it, but if, if you're a freelancer and you're just starting out, people want to dive straight into the conflict. They want to go straight in there because they know that if they get good pictures, they will be able to sell them. Or if they write a great article or they do a great interview, they will be able to, to make their name. Uh, and they, I think people often see it as a shortcut to, to success in a sense. And my advice would be to actually avoid that, uh, that trap because the reality is that conflict zones, and you know, I don't need to tell you this, but conflict zones are incredibly dangerous places and they are best explored with people who have a lot more experience than you, who know what they're doing, and whose expertise will be a sort of guiding light for you while you're inside that place. So when, you know, I spent years going to Iraq with people who knew a lot more about war than I did and going to Afghanistan with people who had seen a lot more combat than I had, and that trip uh, to Syria where we were in the gum battle, I was with a producer, Ben Plesser, who also won the DuPont with me, who now works uh, at NBC News, but he was invaluable to me in terms of coaching me through that situation because turns out there's even a huge difference between covering a conflict where you're embedded with US troops and a conflict where everything is going off all around you and there's no medevac option um, and you're having to think on your feet a lot more you're having to improvise a lot more so I would say to young journalists today you know go to the region if that's what attracts you and try to, in some way, spend time with journalists who have more experience, who you can learn from, and don't feel that you need to run to the front lines to make a name for yourself, because there are other ways to make names for yourselves, and you may well uh, end up at the front lines after some years, but the reality is, I think a lot of people think it's cool, and they think it's glamorous, and they don't realize that it's actually incredibly frightening and incredibly challenging and incredibly stressful. And that is not something you need to run into. That is something you need to slowly sort of ease your way into to get a sense of, because I know people who thought they wanted to do this work and then they go into a situation like that and they have a total breakdown. They, it's not for them. And by the way, that's a normal reaction. That's 95% of humanity is like, yes, I'll have none of that, thank you. That's crazy. Why would you ever want to put yourself in that position? So I really think that war is not glamorous, and it has long-term effects covering it. 
Uh, it really does. So it's something that you want to ease yourself into and you really want to rely on the counsel and wisdom and experience of journalists who have been doing it for a long time. And, and in my experience, I've found that people are willing to take the time to talk to younger journalists, to go over th this sort of thing with them and have more of a discussion about it, and even to let them work with them uh, to introduce them to conflict in the right way. I want to talk a little bit about um, how you prepare for interviews, because I've been really impressed mm. with your ability to ask follow-ups in Thank tough situations you. from people who are pretty intimidating. intimidating. Mm. Yeah, so you seem I don't know, what, how do you prepare for an interview? What are some tips you would give to someone who, who might want to so be in that situation? When I first started uh, contributing pieces to 60 Minutes, I realized that this was going to be the biggest learning curve. Well, actually, there were so many learning curves. <laughs> but one of the biggest challenges is, you know, 60 Minutes is like the art of the interview, essentially. And it's really hard. People always assume that interviews are kind of easy because it's a conversation. And actually, they're not. They're really hard work. Um, so obviously, there's you have to do your research and your homework and understand like everything about the person that you're going to be talking to. And obviously, you and your producer and your team, you want to sit there and plot out some questions and plot out in advance follow-ups. You're sort of anticipating this is what this person's going to say. We've got to be ready to go in there with the, the second question. But I actually think the most valuable thing that I am just starting to really learn and really understand is that when you're doing an interview, you have to listen. And this is a mistake that journalists make all the time, and goodness knows I have made it too. They're doing that, uh-huh, 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 looking down, ready for their next question. What are you ready talking for about? Ready for the next Thank question. Uh-huh, and, and then they ask their next, and it's like, okay, did you hear what he just said? Because he just dropped a doozy on you, and you did not leap in and attack because you were too busy thinking about what your next question was going to be. And so the producers that I've worked with at 60 Minutes have said, I'm taking away your question. You're not even allowed to look at them. Trust me to know that at the end of the interview, if you missed out some questions, I'll tell you what they were and we can go back and ask them. But when you're doing the interview, every ounce of your being needs to be focused on listening to what this person is saying and being ready to jump on them, not just uh, aggressively if they're you know, lying, which happens a lot, but also to be able to tease out something if, they, if they're starting to get emotional. or It's about listening, engaging when the moment is to let it pause and let it breathe and tease it out, and when the moment is to go in for the attack. So asking follow-ups mm. is so important. How do you do that when you're interviewing a group of heavily armed mm. militants or fighters? I would say that I would say two things. First of all, when I'm working on locking down these interviews, I have a pretty straightforward approach with whoever it is that I'm interviewing. And I make sure they understand in advance that, A, no, I cannot provide you with the questions in advance that I will be asking you. That is not the way we work. B, you can be sure they will be hard questions. Um, but C, I will treat you with respect and I will allow you to get your point across. And in my experience, even when you're dealing with jihadis, um, there seems to be a receptiveness to that because ultimately it's fair. I'm not going to take your words out of context. I'm not gonna chop them into 100 pieces and cobble them together in a way that makes it sound like you said something you didn't. I will let you have your say but I also need to be able to ask you tough questions and to be able to call you out if I feel that something needs to be called out on. Now, the one example I can think of, I did a 60 minute story where I had to go back into Syria and confront a, um, a sort of pretty militant Islamist uh, rebel leader with video that essentially proved that his men had been carrying out war crimes. Um, that was petrifying. So sometimes you just have to like look like you're not freaked out and you're allowed to be freaked out on the inside and you just have your exit plan in your head and you just try to get in and get out as quickly as you can. I mean, I'm not going to pretend that it's not uncomfortable because when you're looking at someone and calling them a liar, 
it's uh, incredibly uncomfortable. And everything in our upbringing teaches us to avoid that type of conflict and to avoid making other people feel com uncomfortable and to avoid really awkward situations. And then uh, and the to avoid riling up armed people. Yes, indeed, exactly. <laughs> that would just seem like good common sense, but turns out that that doesn't necessarily lead to good journalism. So we have to do some riling, but we try to do it in a sensible and a fair way. Now, what about the role of digital technology in your mm. job? Obviously, being a correspondent today is a lot different than it was five, even ten years ago. Absolutely. How has it changed your, your, what you do? Well, I did a live shot last week from on board an Italian Coast Guard ship with my iPhone. Nothing but the iPhone. And that was one of those moments where you're like, oh, wow, how the world has changed. It is incredible. And even, you know, I've only been doing this, let's say, 10 years where we, there were already video phones and but even since then, it's gone from being this huge piece of equipment that you would like drag through the desert to an iPhone that you just point. Um, so it's incredible, uh, the leaps and bounds. And we use a, a machine called the Digero now a lot, which again, it's like, you, it's like this big, you carry it with you and you can do a live shot anywhere there is 3G signal. So technology is constantly changing. It's always, uh, you know, a little bit difficult to keep up with it and make sure that you're ahead of the curve. And I am very lucky to work with brilliant people who know I must confess to being something of a Luddite. So I trust the judgment of those around me who understand things much better. And I am consistently blown away by what we're able to achieve um, with relatively little equipment. Because for me, that's my primary concern, is if I'm going to be crawling through a muddy field in the middle of the night to get into Syria illegally, I don't want to have a lot of luggage. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's definitely, it's changed the way we do things, and it's changed, it's made the whole field of news gathering and information dissemination much more democratic, and obviously that there are problems that come with that because it means suddenly everybody's a journalist. Uh, but there are also incredible uh, advantages to having what you saw happening in Syria and across the Arab Spring, all those uprisings and people there with their cell phones. You can't get away with war crimes anymore without them ending up on YouTube. And that's changed the way people see and understand the world. It's also changed the, what our students learn here at Columbia. Mm. What would your advice be to the graduating class of 2015, to students who might be interested in doing what you do? First of all, you, I would say you need to be able to do a little bit of everything. I'm not a gifted shooter, but I have had to shoot many times. Uh, the, the interview I did with the jihadis in Syria, I shot both cameras. The first time I was in Syria uh, posing as a tourist, I was shooting everything. So be able to, you, you don't have to be Fellini. But be able to shoot basic, basic things so that if you are in a situation where you're alone or you're just with one other person and you want to have extra footage and a second camera that you are able to contribute uh, and document what you're seeing going on around you. Be flexible about trying to learn lots of different tools of the trade. I would also say as much as I'm guilty of not being very good at this, you need to understand the technology you need to be able to do, even if it's just really, and I'm talking about television here, but just a really basic editing on your computer, ingesting material, FTPing it, sending it via the internet. This is essential. This is really important. And I've been in situations in the field where like, there'll be three of us who are all simultaneously trying to FTP material so that we can make a deadline. And so it really helps being able to, to do a little bit of everything. Beyond that, I would say, be curious, and it sounds like such an obvious thing, but everything is exciting and interesting, and it's easy to get um, put off or jaded. I think correspondence, when you've been doing it for a while, is sort of the idea that like you've seen it all. Never lose that wide-eyed curiosity. And actually, the journalists who do keep doing this for many years, the reason they keep doing it is because they do still have that. They, we look at someone like Bob Simon is such a great example. Bob Simon, until the very last breath he breathed, was insatiably curious about the world. 
had such an appetite to understand things better, see things firsthand, talk to different people. He would go on a story and walk around a city, even if it didn't directly relate to what he was doing, to just get a feel for the place, talk to the people. He was curious on a fundamental level, and, and you see that, that infectious uh, joy almost that one has when you're confronting and learning about new environments and new people and places and trying to wrap your head around it and contextualize it historically but also tell the story visually you need to have that excitement and that curiosity if you don't have it you can't really fake it because it's so much very 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 hard work uh, that you need to have that little spark absolutely so when we met in January of 2013, mm. you were winning the DuPont for your Syria coverage. You've gone on to be honored with many other awards, but take me back. What did mm. winning that award mean to you? Do you remember that night? Oh, I remember it vividly. And it, I mean, it meant so much to me. It was a huge honor. Um, there are very few awards like the DuPont. It's a very special award um, and it's a very special night. It's a very intimate night. It's a night where you are just dazzled by the other people who are winning awards. Um, just exceptional work being honored. And also for me, of course, what a thrill to have Christian Amanpour giving me this incredible award and giving me a hug and you know, telling me wonderful things about my work. And later on, she sort of pulled me aside and was like, all right, here's the deal you got to have a life to make this work, to do this work and to keep doing it and have a great career. You also, you need to have your girlfriends at home who you go to the movies with and go dancing with and drink wine with and you need to go to art exhibitions and go to the theater and have that balance in your life. And I promise you that's some of the best advice I've ever been given and I'm very grateful for it. So all in all, it was just, uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful night and uh, the award is displayed in a position of great pride in my home, and I am extremely proud of it. I had to argue with my mother. She felt very strongly it should go in her home, um, but I did win out in the end. So, no, it's a, it was a tremendous honor, and um, it's like I said, it's one of, one of very few awards that really, really mean something. John's a role model, obviously. Do you have other oh, people who so look up to? I have so many role models. And, you know, uh, when people ask me who my role models are, they're, they're not all women. I, because I think sometimes there's a, a tendency almost to, like, fetishize the role of, like, the female intrepid war correspondent. And the reality is my role models, I, really probably my greatest role model uh, was Bob Simon, is Bob Simon. Um, to me... The, the level of his writing and his incredible ability to have the courage to go and tell difficult and often painful stories without feeling the need to make it all about him. Um, it's something that I, it's like an example that I really strive towards and I channel it and think about it a lot when I'm writing and when I'm working and um, he's probably my, my greatest role model. So you had watched, you were familiar with his reporting and then you got to meet him when you were at CBS? I did, and, and he was, uh, he's wonderful. I mean, he's such a charming, funny, frank character. And we had so much in common because he, he shared this sort of uh, passion for the Middle East, passion for travel. Um, and so we would have so many great chats. And I'll never forget, he wrote me an email after I had spent six weeks in Egypt during the whole uh, coup or whatever you would like to call it when Morsi was ousted and Sisi came in. And we were anticipating this crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood uh, sort of camp, tent city that they had set up at the Rabah Adawiya Mosque. And I sat there for six weeks. And then I was being honored with an, uh, an honorary doctorate at Middlebury College, so I had to fly to the U.S. And the day I flew to the U.S., of course, the Egyptian army went in and dismantled the camp, and it was horrifying. And so it was like a knife in my heart to the point where I was like crying. And you know, as a journalist, even though you know you can't control the news, 
it still it still stresses us out so much. But Bob Simon wrote me a great email, and he's like, "Hey, kid, here's a list of all the stories that I missed." And then he just like went through, you know. Six day war. I was skiing and like, you know, before cell phones. And um, he was so generous uh, with his advice and with his good humor. And he was just wonderful and absolutely irreplaceable.